Welcome to Views from the Sideline. I'm your host, Joey Tysick. My partner, Malik Hill. We are already in July. July 7th, to be exact. And we're getting closer to the Olympics, like we keep saying. There's a couple things to talk about about the Olympics coming up. Um, we are finally in the NBA Finals. We have the Bucks and the Suns in the NBA Finals. And there's some big news in college sports that we got to talk about. Well, Malik, how are you? How was your Fourth of July holiday? I know we we did end up seeing each other yeah. over the weekend, but got, uh, got together for a little bachelor party. Our friend Chris. Yep. Good times. It was really good times. It was fun. So, but trying yeah. to get back into the swing of things, it, it feels weird. I'm still tired from the weekend. A lot happened, so we got to get into it. Yeah, for in the when it comes to the sports world, it's it's weird, but it's also exciting. Like seeing this matchup in the NBA Finals, I enjoy this type of stuff. Like I've, I'll, I love in every sport when teams that nobody expects make it to the finals. Mm-hmm. But there's also a large section of people that are hating it and claim, and they say their injuries does have a huge part to do with it. But yeah, that really doesn't affect the way I'm, I'm watching basketball. Yeah, like I watch basketball because I love the sport. To me, injuries almost makes things more interesting because I like to see how guys step up when the main guy goes down. Right. Like, that. that's something that I've really loved seeing. Mm-hmm. And that's been a storyline all throughout the playoffs for most teams. And in the end, the Bucks and the Suns have ended up in the finals. And, I mean, at least for the finals now, nobody's really hurt. Giannis is, is back. He, he wasn't 100% probably, yeah. but uh, he's getting close. Um, so the only guys that are really missing from these teams – is uh, Dante DiVincenzo, and we saw Dario Saric leave early in Frank the game. Tank got more minutes. I'm, I'm always good there for some Frank the Tank minutes. Me too. If Love he hits guy. a three in this series, I might bet on him the next game. There you go. <laughs> Which isn't very smart, but, yeah, you got to stick with your guys. Yeah. I just called Frank the Tank one of my guys. I don't know what I'm doing <laughs> today. I don't okay. know. So originally we are going to start with something else, but since we already started talking about the NBA Finals, let's just go right into that. Um and then we'll we'll talk about the rest of the sporting world after that. Um, so yeah, game one happened last night. Suns and the Bucks. Um, the Bucks kind of coming into the finals. They played really good in that final game against the Hawks. Uh, there was a point where the Hawks made a comeback late in the fourth quarter, but I mean Trey Trey Young tried to play in that game, and I almost think that he should not have. Or at least maybe not played the second half or something because he was... He wasn't himself. Yeah, he was just very off. He showed short bursts of like being himself. He'd drive past yeah. somebody and get like an easy layup at the rim, but that was about it. Yeah, and, and he missed a, a lot. And one of the big problems for the Hawks in that game, too, was that, you know, turnovers was was were awful. And the Bucks scored a lot of points off of that. And then Chris Middleton did step up. He had a big, big third quarter. Uh, to kind of pull away from the Hawks. And the Hawks kind of, they made a, a valiant effort. Cam Reddish came in, hit six of seven threes, um, had a really good third quarter of his own. They cut it uh, to six with about three or four minutes left, I think. But um, the Bucks kind of made one more run towards the last two minutes, and that kind of put away the Hawks. I think it shows that the Hawks are still... Just a little too young, a little inexperienced, where they they seem like they crumbled a little bit. And I know again because without Trey Young it makes it tough. But you know, I think I think in the end, the better team won. Like we said multiple times, we wanted the Hawks to win, but the Bucks were probably a slightly better team. Yeah, every every time the Hawks would try to sneak back or look like they could get into the game. I don't know about you, but there was there was also always something in the back of my mind. Even though we were cheering for the Hawks to come back, there was always something in the back of my mind like the Bucks 
th- this is it. They still have this in control. Because mm-hmm. like every time the Hawks tried to come back, the Bucks would punch back. Whether it was Drew Holiday or Chris Middleton or Brooke Lopez, who had a really good stretch of games, and he played, still played really well in game one yesterday. And Bobby Portis had the series of his life. Everybody did their part for them to finish that series. And yeah, like you said, they were the better team. I still think, not that, yeah, I, you know what, yeah. I do wish the Bucks would have lost because I wanted to see the Hawks in the finals. Right. I don't think Budenholzer should like be kept on for years on because they made this finals run. I still think they need to make a reevaluation when it comes to coaching because he still has problems with making adjustments. Mm-hmm. They still lose games that they shouldn't lose, and they still play dumb too many times at times when they shouldn't. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, they came together. They they were the better team in the end, and they got answers from everybody whenever when they needed them. Yeah. So, yeah, and then, Drew, Drew and Chris Middles, they had big, big performances that last. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Drew, Drew Holiday, I think, kind of surprised me the most. He <clears> played <throat> how people... I I don't know if people expected him to like be doing that game in and game out, but people expected more of that from him, and he showed it in that game. Yeah, especially with Giannis out, I think. Um, so now that led us into, like I said, game one of the finals that happened last night. The Suns have kind of been sitting around for a little while. Um, they they showed some. Both teams show a little bit of rust. Yeah, but it was also it, I think it was good for the Suns to get a little bit of rest. Devin Booker was kind of banged up towards the end of their series with his nose. And Chris Paul was still kind of getting himself back to, you know, normal a little bit. Um, So in this game, Phoenix, they just had control the whole game. Um, It was fairly close. Phoenix, I mean, uh, Milwaukee, they made a real, like, comeback stretch. Yeah. In the, was it the the third quarter or was it the fourth? It was the fourth. Yeah, they got within, like, six points in the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. But then Phoenix... Almost like Milwaukee did to Atlanta in that game six. Phoenix had an answer for every single time they came back. Yeah. And again, Giannis was just coming back from his injury. Um, he was efficient. Uh, he 20 was, and 17, yeah, still. Yeah. It, he was okay from the free throw line. He was 7 to 12, which, you know, for Giannis is not bad. Um, he only shot two threes. He made one. So, like, he really didn't look all that bad. He just. You know, he only took 11 shots because he's still trying to get his legs back under him, and he only played 35 minutes, whereas Chris Middleton played 45. Drew Holiday played 40. Um, and this time was a game where Drew struggled. Um, he did good everywhere else. He had seven rebounds, nine assists, which he's been he's been closing in on triple-double almost every game recently. Um, but his shot just it was not there. Yeah, I, I honestly think he's somewhat been playing out of position for them because he's not really a true point guard. He's more of a two guard mm-hmm. that can run offense. But yeah, he's he's really like a like a he's a two guard that's great on the defensive end as well. He's he yeah. can table set, but that's not his like main thing. When he has to do both, he has nights where he can't get the scoring going. Yeah, I agree. And I and it's hard because they the, like they play PJ Tucker. So that kind of throws a wrench in a lot of their lineups, I think. Um, I get why they have P.J. Tucker, but to me it just it just makes lineups that much harder when you have a guy that's – he's a small, smaller guy, but he guards big guys, and he doesn't give you a lot on the offense. Yeah, all, all he does on offense, he either stands in the corner stands in the corner, or goes to rebound. Right. It's one of those two options. Or sets the occasional pick, which he doesn't yeah. really roll from it that much. Right. So then you can't play, you can't do something like playing Jeff Teague alongside Drew Holiday or something like that. Um, you basically have to run Drew at the at the point, which, like you said, he's not necessarily a traditional point himself. Um, the one thing too, though, that they've definitely gotten out of these last few games since Giannis got hurt is that Brook Lopez has found himself back to somewhat a form of what he was last year. We had kind of a crazy year of shooting threes and all that stuff or two years ago even. Um, so it's good production. Like Brooke Lopez scored 17 points in 23 minutes for them, which I think is, is really big for the bucks. When he, when he get, when he gets that type of game, you expect that you would win when you get that type of game from yeah. Brooke Lopez. But yeah, it still ended up. They, they just couldn't, they never had true momentum in the game. Right. And again, I mean, 
we've seen it all playoffs now is the, the Suns are just they are tough to beat because there they're, are so many yeah. guys. They're they're deeper than everybody expected. Yeah, and it's mostly come from like angry LeBron fans that keep saying if the Lakers were fully healthy, they would have like swept the Suns or something. Like yeah. This Suns team is for real. Mm-hmm. Like I, I don't care who was hurt. I don't care. LeBron played. Right. If you play, you don't make excuses. LeBron played. AD in the end wasn't able to finish it. Yeah. But the Suns were just better. Right. The Suns have just been a better overall team than most teams. Mm-hmm. And even if if the Nuggets had Jamal Murray, I still think the Suns might have won. They their chemistry has just been top notch. Everybody that comes into the game knows their roles and they play them almost to perfection. Cam Johnson has barely missed in like the past six games. He's just been on fire. Mm -hmm. And people forget, I think he's just a second year player, but he's like 26. Yeah. He spent four years or was it five years in North Carolina? Four or five years in North Carolina. Yeah. And he stepped in and was immediately ready to contribute. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows I'm not the big Tory Craig fan, but he plays his role. Mm-hmm. campaign has become a brand new player he's playing like his college self again he's playing with full confidence yeah everybody that comes in does their part and like every they have so many different lineups that work together they all like they all know how to play with each other on the court and like where each other is going to be and it yeah. shows it's shown in almost every series yeah and and one of the big things that we've and a lot of people have started taking notice on is DeAndre Ayton is... He's for real. He's a real deal. Listen, he is what... there's There's been some Andre Drummond controversies the past few days because mm-hmm. somebody sent a message. I don't know if it was to him or they just generally posted that they wish Andre Drummond could dominate in the paint like old like older Lakers centers. Mm-hmm. And Andre Drummond said, if Vogel gave me more minutes, I would dominate in the paint, which we both know is complete nonsense. Yeah, I mean, he would... Yeah. He would get you stats, but... If you watch closely, Andre's not necessarily dominating anybody yeah. in the paint. And of all that to come around and say, DeAndre Ayton is making the impact people thought Andre Drummond was going to make. Mm-hmm. Andre Drummond, I mean, Andre DeAndre Ayton doesn't drop a pass. His hands are huge and strong. He catches everything. Mm-hmm. He has soft, soft, extremely soft touch around the rim. He finishes most hook shots. When he goes for layups, he had a play yesterday where he was like running full court trailing, caught it from the three point line, took two steps, and finished with the left hand. It wasn't too strong, just finished with a layup. Yeah. The thing that I think separates DeAndre Ayton and Andre Drummond, too, is that to, to me, it feels like Ayton tends to know what he wants to do right away. Yes. And with Andre yes. Drummond, the problem always was that he would somewhat stagnate the offense and do like all these post-ups and back you down and take all this time. The reason DeAndre Ayton is so efficient is because he just goes right to his spot. He knows what he wants to do right away. Drummond needs more of a full-on post-up game. It is too late now. <laughs> yeah. It's it's too late. Mm-hmm. Team, I think at this point, teams know what Andre Drummond is, especially after this stretch in LA, which he had, he had some good games. But it's clear, like, this kid right here, I mean, his his free throw touch, like, he was hitting all net on most free throws. Like, his mid-range game has been yeah. almost automatic. He's shooting 71% from the field mm-hmm. for the entire playoffs. Oh. Every rebound, like, every point he puts in, it seems it, it makes a huge impact every time Yeah, he does something. And it, it, it's clear, like, you can see it whenever he makes a play. Yeah, it makes a huge dent in the game, mm-hmm. and it's weird that he's he's this young, at this level, and he's not shaken, yeah. he's not afraid. He just he does exactly what he's so consistent mm-hmm. at this point, and it took him a few years to be able to get to this level. But everybody always saw the potential. That's why he was the number one pick. Yeah. But now, yeah, he's he's hitting. He almost had a twenty twenty game, game one of the finals, mm-hmm. and he's yeah he's pretty much the most reliable player they have at this point. Yeah. Because you know exactly what you're going to get from him. Yeah, and I mean, the big stat that I just saw, too, that I didn't realize beforehand, the Bucks shot 9 of 16 from the free throw line, 56%. Um, and they had 13 turnovers, which 13 turnovers isn't too bad. I think Phoenix, did they miss a free throw? Shooting free throws is bad. 
But Phoenix was 25 of 26 yeah. from the free throw line. So they, Chris Paul didn't miss one. Jay Crowder, you ruined it for everyone. He <laughs> yeah. went one of two. Yeah, that, that's Jay Crowder, Ma- though. Mikhail Bridges went two of two. DeAndre Ayton went six of six. CP3 went four of four. Booker went 10 of 10. Cam Johnson went two of two. And they only had nine turnovers. Turnovers and free throws are huge in playoff series. Yeah. And for this team to be a mix of really young players and some veterans, like that's pretty, that's good to see for them. And a- another player we keep talking about, Chris Paul. So happy for that guy. One of my favorite, like I've said it m- multiple times, one of my favorite players of all time. Um, And to see him join this Suns team, I was pretty excited because I was already, I liked the Suns before. I'm sure people are on bandwagons for the Suns now because of Suns and Four, all that stuff. They got a lot going for them. Devin Booker's fun to watch. But I'm here to tell you, I liked the Suns beforehand. And now that the FCP3 has made it even better. So it's just fun to watch. Um, especially prove like Chris Paul has had so many haters over the years. And we've talked, again, we've talked about it at length. Is like, he still got it. He went 12 and 19 in this game, four or seven from three. He had, he led the team with 32 points. Devin Booker struggled a little bit. Like Chris Paul just knows how to manage a team. And that's so underrated for so many, so many people that kind of goes unnoticed. And yeah, I enjoy it. Anything else you have on the Suns? Uh, I, at this point, I don't. I don't know what else to say about Chris Paul's greatness. At this point, really, he's just been like, if it wasn't for the like sitting out with COVID, I really think he would have had an even better like run in the Clippers series. He finished it out like with an all time great performance. But the the hate when it comes to Chris Paul. I can understand some of it because he does silly little childish things, the flopping, the pulling and pushing on people's arms, the doing like little dirty stuff to gain leverage, which is stuff I don't completely mind because I like a more physical game. And I understand that Chris Paul does not have the gifts that most of these dudes have. Right. He's not 6'8", 260 like LeBron. Mm -hmm. He can't jump out the gym like D. Rose and Russell Westbrook. He doesn't even have the athleticism 5'9", Isaiah Thomas had. Mm-hmm. Which like he was able to get to the rack so easily and finish on people because he was super super quick and had ridiculous athleticism for his size like a vertical in the forties. Yeah, Chris Paul doesn't have those. Mm-hmm. So at this age, I don't know what type of game people expect him to play. Like he he can't just play like like Jamal Murray or one of these other like he can't be Trey Young. He can't be these other point guards. Yeah. with extreme <laughs> quickness, like elite athleticism. All, all the extra stuff that these guys have to take them to the next level. Chris Paul just has to be a great basketball player. Yeah. And the older he gets, he has to keep adding more little advantages when it comes to IQ and skill and toughness mm-hmm. to be able to play at this level. And if people hate that, it is what it is. Right. But I love the fact that he is 36 years. He is 36 years old. And he is still giving people this type of game. Mm-hmm. And just like he has a counter for everything you have to that that comes at him, like the play yesterday, where Giannis he got a ball on a fast break and Giannis was trailing him down. He was going to block his shot, mm-hmm. so Chris Paul slowed down, let Giannis bump into him, made the layup and won. Mm-hmm. Today people were complaining, saying he's a dirty player and that that shouldn't be allowed and nobody should do that. What was he supposed to do, Joey? Right. What do you want him? What to what? Do? That is a. That's what we I, like I, comment, I commented to the tweet saying, "Was Gian, Was he just supposed to let Giannis block his shot? Right. What was What was he supposed to do? There was no scenario where Chris Paul just goes up for a regular layup, and he doesn't get blocked. That's what we like to call crafty. The, and you know what else was Chris Paul supposed it, to do in that situation? You know, the funny thing is that's kind of the player that I always had to be. So I I respect that kind of thing because I'm not the most athletic. I'm I'm a shooter through and through. I have some athleticism, but like other people are going to be more. So for guys that are like that, you have to think outside of the box of what you're going to be able to do. You have to take into account what these other players are, are trying to do. And you have to evaluate that very quickly. And Chris Paul is one of the best at it. Like you're saying, like he's crafty. Um, 
And I think the other thing too, that like the Suns do so well that not many teams nowadays do is shoot the mid range. Chris Paul is one Chris of the best Devin, players. Devin Booker is almost, is almost only like 25 and he's pretty yeah. much a master. And both of those guys are so good at just giving you a short hesitation, taking one dribble, either crossing back or just stopping on a dime and pulling up in your face. Chris Paul has been doing that for years because he's undersized. And but years prior, he was like a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. So he wouldn't have to do all of, all of the extra stuff, like super extra stuff he does today. Yeah. There was a time where his handles were too quick and he was faster and quicker than other people. Mm -hmm. But now he, he can't play that way. Yeah. Nowadays, he has to kind of do a couple in and out dribbles or get to a little spot before he pulls up. Exactly. But at the same time, when he pulls up, it's quick. And so... Like that's that's a thing that's really hard to guard, and if if you're so used to it with guys like Chris Paul and Devin Booker, it's almost like a free throw at some point. Um, pretty much. So the, the, it's for Chris Paul. I it is pretty much like muscle memory to him at this mm -hmm. point. Those mid range, even every time he takes the the mid range shot where he goes to the right of the basket, turns and fades away. I I couldn't hit that shot in like ten ten out of. I couldn't hit that shot five out of ten times. Yeah, like if I tried it several times. Mm -hmm. And it's, but it's it's just second nature to him at this point. Right. It's just a normal like almost like a free throw, like you said. Yeah, and it's nice to see like Chris Paul has made that transition that you know you see some guards be able to do as they get older, like Jason Kidd, where they become really really lethal shooters. And I think that's what Chris Paul has done. Chris Paul even to more of a degree than Jason Kidd, because um, Jason Kidd was more of a facilitator, just straight up. But he started being able to knock down threes later in his career. Um, and Chris Paul is in a similar vein where, like, his shot is just so clean nowadays that it makes it really tough. Um, yeah, but I – last thing on the Chris Paul. I think go ahead. it's just fans today, I think they, they don't have really a grasp on – this is such a generation of players that, like, do – extraordinary things on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. This is an age of such high level of athleticism and speed and shot making and skill that it's impossible for NBA fans of today to, to look at what Chris Paul does. And they, they think it's unnecessary mm -hmm. and that it shouldn't be done because they see LeBron and KD and Jason Tatum and Zion Williamson. They don't have to do it. Trey Young doesn't have to do it. Why do, why does Chris Paul, it's a different skill. He does not have what they have. It's a different skill set. He doesn't have what they have. So you so when when a freak of a man that seven foot is chasing you down to block yeah. you, you have to do things like stop, let him bump into you and shoot. Because what's the alternative? It, well, it's also a difference between being LeBron, KD, who are guys that are aging that are still seven foot, it's 200. A, they still have those things. <laughs> like, yeah. they still have size at the end of the day. Chris Paul, as he's aging, he's losing athleticism, and his height's not helping him anymore. Exactly. Um, That's, I, I don't know what people expect. I don't know how they expect him to play the game. Yeah. And if if anything, for, for people that don't understand, because, you know, I, I used to say this all the time about people knowing Andre Iguodala for a 3 and D kind of guy for the Warriors. When he came into the league... <laughs> He was nowhere, nowhere near that. Allen Iverson was leaving Philly soon, and he became the guy within a few years. Iggy was a human highlight reel type of guy. Um, and similar to CP3, like, go back and watch CP3 highlights. He took the prime spurs to a game seven. By himself. With, with a not loaded New Orleans Hornets team. Yeah. that That's what he was doing in his prime. Yeah. He had some stuff. So just go back, look. You know, yeah. these younger generations don't really know some of these guys that are fading out of the league. Is that really. is there's there's a era of basketball in a, in a like a oh I wouldn't say an IQ but it's just a an understanding of basketball that watchers today do do not understand. Mm -hmm. Like dudes our age and younger, just they just they just don't get it. Mm -hmm. They see they see today's game yeah. and everything besides this is either trash or. It wasn't good basketball. And I think that'll, that'll happen in every generation. Like, can you imagine when, like, Magic, Larry, MJ were all leaving the league and, like, you had all these, like, Shaq and Tim Duncan, AI, Kobe coming in and 
people are like, oh, what are these guys? Like, I'm sure they thought AI and Kobe and stuff were super flashy and, you know, played the game a little differently, but that's how it always works. You know, you lose stars that play one way and then the next era plays a different way. So, I don't know. It makes it fun, but also you <laughs> now we are at that age where we're kind of like, come on, re- respect our generation too. I'm- I think this the lack of physicality has really just changed people's mindsets on basketball. Yeah, that that and it's it's weird to me. I will never lose my mindset of basketball should be physical, mm-hmm. and when it's not, it's nonsense. Yeah, I still love watching basketball, but the way they call basketball today is ridiculous. I'm sure I'm sure you agree. Yeah. When like I'm that that tech or flagrant Brook Lopez got yesterday was absolutely nonsense. Yeah, I mean I I, I come from the era of. The going to work Pistons, where they scored half of what the Suns scored last night. Pacers Pistons, seventy four seventy six ending. Yeah, <laughs> in an Eastern Conference Final game. Well, there was a streak back in the day when the Pistons had held opponents under eighty points for a long time, and that is yeah. a rare occurrence to even happen in an NBA season nowadays. Real defense is a thing of the past. Mm-hmm. But these these kids today, they don't care. To be fair, they though, they just want to see buckets and skill and, and yeah. hops. To be fair, which about defense, I loved when I was little. Yeah, but it is harder yeah. though now that this, the floor is being stretched because you got guys like Damian Lillard and Steph Curry, Trey Young that are shooting deeper, so it's pulling defenses farther away. So that's that's part of it. But at the same time, there is a lack of somewhat of of defense. Um, do you think the Bucks have a chance in this series? I don't think they have a serious chance to win it, especially. If if Giannis was fully healthy, I'd say it's a chance it goes seven. But I think Phoenix is just, especially with DiVincenzo out, I think Phoenix is just better right mm-hmm. now. Like they're they're so did they go eight nine almost nine deep if they needed to. Yeah. And yeah, every every rotation they play, everybody that comes in, they have somebody that can give them a spark at all times. Mm-hmm. And there are there are stretches when the Bucks don't have somebody that can do that do that on the court. Yeah. And I mean. DeAndre Aiden can slightly match up with Giannis. Jay Crowder is a similar vein to PJ Tucker, but he has a shot. Chris Middleton and Mikhail Bridges, which Mikhail Bridges is a good defender. You don't know which Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday are going to get game to game. Yeah. That's that's probably the biggest thing. Why? I, I think I'm going to take Suns in five. I, I think Milwaukee gets a home game, but... Chris Middleton and Drew are so unpredictable from one game to the next. Yeah. And even if Giannis gets healthy and starts averaging like 32 and 15, a Brooke Lopez isn't going to average 25 this series. Like Bobby Portis isn't going to – he could, but I don't think there's chances he keeps playing out of his mind. Brent Forbes has been up and down through all throughout these. They don't have enough. Mm-hmm. They, they just don't have enough. And making it to the finals with this team is pretty great. That they've done it, but yeah, yeah, I think the Suns are just better. Oh, well, and that's what I keep saying about the Bucks rotation is like they keep playing Pat Connaughton twenty eight minutes, PJ Tucker thirty three minutes. Those guys just don't give you enough offensively, Ex- exactly, as like backup options. It's just not enough. So they got Giannis, Chris Middleton, Drew Holiday, and Brooke Lopez are kind of their their top four guys. But there's a lot of question marks around all of them. And once you get past those four, it's like, who's the next one to step up? Because as soon as Giannis is back in, Bobby Portis is playing 14 minutes. So yeah. it's just all over the place. And that's something, you know, you talked about before is like, Budenholzer's lineups, something's up. And it's like, they need to figure something out because it's not working. Yeah. They're they're playing Jeff Teague a lot. Mm-hmm. And... I don't know if this was the time to just unleash Jeff Teague like he was going to be like a real key figure in the finals. But I think he's like, he's been pretty good. He's helping. He's helping. Yeah. But like you, but they're not, it's not enough. But they're also not fully committing to it. Like Jeff Teague only played 10 minutes in this game. Well, like if you're going to start using him, I feel like you got to. Well, what minutes are you going to take away from Drew Holiday? Or do you start playing Jeff Teague and Drew Holiday together? Like that's that's something. Well, that's what I'm saying. PJ Tucker really. He causes lineup problems. I get like the point of PJ Tucker. I get the appeal of PJ Tucker. But the Bucks need offense right now. I, I don't think they need like 
P.J. Tucker, I don't know what he did in that game last night because Chris Paul had 32, DeAndre Ayton had 22, Devin Booker, he was a little bit slowed, but how many times did P.J. Tucker guard Devin Booker? He can't guard Devin. P.J. Tucker can't exactly. guard Devin Booker. That's what they they put Drew on Devin Booker most of the time. Jay Crowder was the only and one that struggled. Yeah, Devin Booker was inefficient, but he still got buckets when he needed them. Right. And then when you have Drew Holiday on Booker, then Chris Paul's free to do what he wants. There, there was a point where they, it was like a five minute stretch where they just kept ended up with Bobby Portis on CP3 or Devin Booker. It just kept happening. Yeah. And I was like, Bud, I understand you don't make adjustments, but mm-hmm. this is uh, this might be a time to do it to change something up. Maybe he just kept letting Bobby Portis get put on that island. Yeah. And CP3 was just cooking. Right. And that's what I'm saying. Like. I don't. I don't know. I don't yeah. think I really. Right. I, I don't think the. Even if Bud wanted to make adjustments, I don't know what, like, what new answer could they come up with to win I feel, the series. So, I think I said it before. If they're gonna commit to like a bigger lineup, people have been saying this all throughout the playoffs. <laughs> get rid of PJ Tucker and put Bobby Portis in there. Drew Holiday, Chris Middleton, Giannis, Portis, and Lopez. It's huge. I mean, I don't disagree. They would, they would probably have a better start on offense, not starting PJ Tucker too. Yeah, Bobby, that's what I mean. Bobby Porter, it's a much better flow on offense when Bobby is out there, right? Or like I said, or you do the two guard of Jeff Teague and Drew Holiday. That's just mine. I don't, you know, I'll send my resume into yeah. the Bucks in the off season, but yeah, I like Pat Connaughton, but there's there's only so much he's giving you. Right, exactly. He's, he's an, an extremely sh- streaky three-point shooter. Mm-hmm. He's going to make two and then miss five. Yeah. Yep, I agree. All righty. So that's the finals. We got uh, game two tomorrow. Are you doing every other day? or Yeah, yeah every, it's Thursday. Next game is Thursday. Yeah, okay. So we got a couple games. We'll get a couple finals games in before yeah, the next after episode. After Thursday, it's Sunday. Okay, so yeah, two that's days. What I, that's what I kind of yeah. figured. So the NBA Finals will not be over, even if the Suns sweep by the time next episode happens, which is nice. It will be. Oh, actually, it might be if they play Sunday and then they play Tuesday. Well, okay, <laughs> we might have the end of the NBA season. We'll see. Um, okay, the. You want to talk about the draft, or you want to talk about the NIL stuff? I think we could go into the draft. Okay. Yeah, just stay on NBA right now. Okay, and then we'll move into that. Okay, so we wanted to do similar to how we did uh, the NFL Yeah. when we got closer to the draft. The, three, is it three weeks away? Three weeks? It's July 29th, so. Yeah, it's basically three weeks. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the NBA draft is on July 29th. So websites have started posting some of their mock drafts. We wanted to kind of start talking about draft stuff review some of these mock drafts um, and see what's going on. So Malik pulled up a Bleacher Report mock draft. Malik, you want to go through um, pick by pick for me, and then we will discuss kind of each one. And then I'll, okay. I'll, I have NBC Sports also up just as comparisons. So go ahead. So number one, our Detroit Pistons. It's still so crazy just saying that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it says obviously the Detroit Pistons are considering other players and looking at other things and trades and stuff. When you have the number one pick, that's what you're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. You're supposed to keep certain news and certain teams' ears, let other GMs give them an idea of certain things, kind of keep people off balance. But they, at the end of the day, we know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Cade wants to be here, which is um, which is pretty much the best part of it. Cade wants to be here. The Pistons probably will draft him number one. Yeah. And I think the more that Cade embraces it, I think the more the Pistons need to just stick with picking Cade. Yeah. Sure, you can throw out the, like, oh, we're thinking about taking Jalen Green. Just, you know, if if teams throw some sort of crazy offers out there, you you look at it, I guess. But you don't – if a guy wants to come here, you you take him. Because if he's at the top of the draft board and he's okay with coming here – and he's, he's he has, not like, oh, yeah. I don't want to be in Detroit. Detroit stinks or whatever. Okay, well, maybe then we'll think about Jalen Green. But yeah. if he sounds like he's committed to this, I don't know how you don't pick him. He he has that level of talent, and he wants to be here. That's that's what's most exciting. 
Yeah. And the just the the thoughts of how and how many ways he would fit. Mm-hmm. Like is it it just it's a dream. And like it's such we, a dream. We say a lot as Pistons fans, if you embrace the Pistons and the Detroit culture the, and the love you will get. Exactly. Just Blake Griffin. One I was just Blake about to Griffin say one season in, of one season of Blake giving his heart to Detroit. He got traded to Detroit. People were all over the place because a lot of people love Tobias Harris. And a lot of people are really skeptical of the trade. They were they were like, oh, it's kind of exciting because it's a bigger name. We don't get that a lot. But we're like, uh, I don't know. But then Blake played, and he looked like he wanted to play here. And Pistons fans ate it up. And we embraced him. He got hurt in that Milwaukee playoff series. Fans cheered him off the court. Mm-hmm. He still tried to play. And when it, when it was clear that he was done, he got a standing ovation. Yep. But when he dropped us, we dropped him. Well, is that is that really true? Yes. I mean, maybe yeah, maybe it's just me. Like I I wasn't mad that this year he wasn't giving it his all in Detroit because he knew what the writing on the wall was. He knew he was probably out soon, and they were in a whole like they were starting over with Troy Weaver. Yeah, but it's a little bit about how he like Detroit. De- he like went on Twitter and stuff, and I don't know, just little things that he said like kind of off putting. He's. He's he's Blake Griffin. He's I don't know. He's a comedian. He likes to talk. It is what it is to me. If it was somebody, if it was somebody else, I w- I would have been like more angry, maybe. But yeah, yeah, I appreciate what he gave. But yeah, Cade number one. Not much argument about yeah, it. Just em- just embrace it. No number two. Instant instant arguments from here on. Honestly, because everybody knows the players that are going one to five, mm-hmm. but the order they go in, there is no guarantee. Right. But here at Bleacher Report, number two, they have the Houston Rockets going with, who I kind of expect them to take, Mm -hmm. Jalen Green, guard, came out of high school, played G League Ignite for a year. Out of high school, I didn't like him much Mm -hmm. because it it seemed like to me he was just straight up like raw on offense. Yeah, It seemed like he didn't work on much, and he just like went out there and just kind of hooped like he was in pickup games. But in the G League games, it seemed like he focused on a lot of things. His jumper got better. He was playing in a pick and roll. He was looking smooth in it. And his finishing overall besides Duncan. Because a lot of these young dudes, they it takes them a long time to figure out you can't just dunk on everybody every possession. Mm-hmm. Instead of dunking on people, he was still almost eye level with the rim. But there were a lot of possessions where he was finger rolling, up and under layups. He was doing a lot more, a, a better job finishing. He was showing the signs of a guy who could be a very high level scorer in the NBA. And right. That's the reason why they have him placed here at number two. And I I wouldn't I, I would understand if they took him and tried to pair him with um uh what's his the, the shooting guard left hander. Kevin Porter. Kevin Porter. Yeah, Kevin Porter, he he had a outrageous fifty point game this season. Nobody saw it coming. Mm-hmm. But everybody knew the level of talent talent Kevin Porter had. Yeah. He has perennial all star, thirty point a game type talent. Mm-hmm. But he's immature, he's still a kid. And he has to figure out how to be an NBA player. Right. And he's showing signs. They got Christian Wood. They still got to figure out the point guard situation. But, but John Walls looked all right. He's looked all right, but he's like, the, he had the injuries are still there. He's not something they're going to invest in. Yeah, no, but like at least to... You can keep him there for, for a little bit before right. thinking about trading. They're not going to yeah. contend or anything next year even. So like to have a veteran point guard around, I think, is okay for them. Yeah, but... Jalen Green at two, pairing him with Kevin Porter, having you can never go wrong with especially everybody seeing the Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. Everybody wants to have those types of like under twenty five, two guys that can go get a bucket and do other things. Right. You draft Jalen Green, you could potentially have that with him and Kevin Porter. Mm-hmm. So how do you feel about that one? The fit, him going to Houston. I I, to me personally, because like we saw them get a lot out of Kevin Porter. We saw them get a lot out of Jay Sean Tate. It starts to feel like that guard forward area starts to get heavy for them. They, and, got, they also have Kenyon Martin Jr. Who's going to be there for, yeah. Well, he, he showed he, some really good signs. He played really good down the stretch. Yeah. So like, to me, I feel like they'd be better off. I don't know. It, it's, I guess it depends if you consider Jalen Suggs 
somebody that can transition to a more true point guard in the league. That that really is that's what he is. Honestly. Um, he can be a combo guard, but he's more of a floor general, right? And that that can. That can that's where I categorize him, but it it depends on the Rockets themselves. But I would take either Jalen Suggs or Evan Mobley because you can pair Evan Mobley with Christian Wood, I think, really nicely. Um, as good as Jalen Green is, I just I, I don't see where the fit is with some of these top teams for for him, unfortunately. But uh, NBC Sports also has Jalen Green going number two. Yeah, so. I think it it would be an interesting pick. I'd like to see that summer league team. That's what I'd like to see because with the summer league coming back, mm-hmm. Jalen Green, Kenyon Martin Jr. I don't know if they've had. I think they might have Kevin Porter play just to like for them to build chemistry. Yeah, that'd be really interesting to see how they all play together. Mm-hmm. Three, those, those Cleveland Cavaliers. I don't. I don't even like saying their name. Just they, without LeBron mentioning their name is just. It's almost like it's like a curse on them. Recently, they would be called the Cleveland Centers because they keep <laughs> they had like eight centers. on the roster. <laughs> they had like eight on the roster. But yeah, the past few years, they honestly haven't made bad picks. They got Colin Sexton, who's pretty much their like franchise guy. Mm-hmm. Darius, Garland. Darius Garland made progress this year, but who knows how long they'll keep them together because there could be other better options. Yep. Isaac Okoro. Isaac Okoro showed some signs, and they got the steal. Of the season almost. Just taking Jared Allen away from Brooklyn. Yeah. I still will never understand. Okay, I understand DeAndre Jordan is your friend, Kevin Durant. Mm -hmm. He's friends with these veterans. But the fact that Jared Allen just wasn't the focal point big man for that team from the jump is insane. Yeah. It will always be crazy. Mm -hmm. And it didn't work out for them in the end. Yeah. So Cleveland just stole Jared Allen. And he showed it from the jump when he got to Cleveland that he was the better option. Yeah. And they don't even know if they're committed to Jared Allen now. Which is ridiculous. So. Absolutely. Absolute nonsense. What does Bleacher Report say they're going to do? It says Evan Mobley. Yeah. Which pairing him and Jared Allen would be great also. Because they're two completely different types of players at the. Yeah. Evan Mobley is more of a four and Jared Allen is a true five. Yeah. So Jared Allen would basically mainly be in the paint. He's not stepping out to shoot jumpers much. Mm -hmm. He can, like, from time to time, but he's really not going to. Evan Mobley is, he's he's a rare kind of power forward. He's a guy that can kind of be a point forward. He can handle the ball surprisingly well for the type of player he is. Right. Like, he can post up. He can, he has, like, basic post moves that are very effective. He can stretch out and hit a jumper. He has decent three-point range, and... If you hand him the ball and have him set up things, he can do that too. Mm-hmm. So Cleveland taking him, it would be a great pick for them, but just him going to Cleveland, it, I just feel bad for him. Like that's that starting five of Sexton, Garland, they like to call it sex land. <laughs> <laughs> Okoro, Mobley, and Jared Allen. On very, paper, very young core. On too. paper, that sounds like a very good rebuild, doesn't it? Yeah. But it's just where they're located. Mm-hmm. It's just unfortunate. Yeah, like I, I'm gonna watch them when when the, when they are on TV, because I like those players. But yeah, mm-hmm. it would be a great pick for Cleveland. Yeah, if they if he landed to the match. I do think that that's probably their one of their better options. Um, outside of that, yeah, I don't know because they've they've addressed the guards, they addressed the forward, so I feel like getting somebody to go along with Jared Allen. Or if they're actually not committed to Jared Allen, that they get another big. I think that's yeah. kind of what they need. They would also, like, people would be confused, but they shouldn't be. If they got Evan Mobley, they would probably be a top 10 defensive team. Because Evan Mobley and Jared Allen yeah, in the paint, blocking shots. And, like, they have high verticals. They can jump, and they're really good defenders to round it out. Mm-hmm. So it would be hard to score on them in the paint. Yeah. So it, it would be a no-doubter if we fell to three. Mm-hmm. Number four to the Raptors. Toronto Raptors. They, they. It seems like they always, even with a down season where they had to play in Tampa, they they always get like ju- just those lucky breaks. Mm-hmm. Whether it's drafting Pascal Siakam and him becoming as good as he is, ending up with Kawhi Leonard and him taking them to a championship. Undrafted, 
Fred, Fred Van Vliet, best guard they have at this point. Mm-hmm. Kyle Lowry will be gone soon if they're smart. Yeah, they should trade. They they need to trade him soon. And Jalen Suggs is sitting right there for him. Suggs yep. and Van Vliet together together mm-hmm. could be their front court of the future. Right. And then that keeps a backcourt of the future. And, and that keeps their, their core young, where you have Jalen Suggs, Fred Van Vliet, Pascal, OG Ananobi is still getting better. Um, and then they just got Gary Trent Jr. They so could, like, yeah, they could keep, hopefully they resign him. Yeah. So he, uh, they still have a young core that also has experience at the same time. Um, you throw Jalen Suggs in there, who's been a winner since he's been in high school. He so. won't. He won't be afraid at all. He'll be ready from the jump. Exactly. Even though he's so young, I feel like he'd be very similar to Fred Van Vliet, where Van Vliet was like, in college. He was a winner, and so Jalen Suggs is a, a very similar vein where they're just ready to play. Yeah, I I really like that point you made. Van Vliet, Ananobi, and P- S- Pascal are all very young, but they have so much playoff experiences. Yeah, they're almost like like old trusted veterans mm-hmm. that like all rookies look up to. Yeah. But and yeah, if from Jaylen, their ages, it wouldn't seem like it. And if Jalen Suggs can become a really good point guard rather quickly, then, you know, that takes a little bit of the pressure off of Pascal again. Cause it seemed like he struggled a little bit at times this yeah. year. Once, once the spotlight got on him mm-hmm. and people started to pay a lot more attention, it's almost like him starting in the all-star game was kind of a down thing for him. Yeah. I don't know if that's exactly what happened with him, like too much pressure, but like before that All Star appearance last season, when he was just going off, mm-hmm. like that first game of the season against the Pelicans, when he had like forty four and seventeen, yeah, it was like he arrived, mm-hmm. and then he just kept that play going all the way up to the All Star game, twenty four a game, like eight or nine rebounds, he was balling. Playoffs comes, he knows dives, yeah. So yeah, he he had. Some ups and downs. He had really good stretches and some down, some bad games last season. But if they got Jalen Suggs, just more positives for Toronto if they were able to get him. Yeah. Number five. Number five. The Orlando Magic. They are in. They've just been in they, limbo. They are very for like similar. The past Ten years, man. They're very similar to the Cavs. If you put their like their young core on paper, it looks somewhat promising. But they're in Orlando. But it's weird that that's become the thing, because Orlando was a very good franchise for a while. Yeah. Even after the Shaq and Penny era, you get T Mac. Grant Hill gets hurt, still end up being a playoff team. Mm-hmm. T Mac leaves. You draft Dwight Howard. Get Jameer Nelson, Hito Turkaloo. You make you all to, these great you go moves. Go to the NBA Finals. Go to the NBA Finals. Next few years, Dwight Howard leaves. You still make the playoffs a few times, mm-hmm. and then it all falls apart. It all just crumbles, and they haven't been able to. Yeah, they made the playoffs twice since then, but they really, they haven't really had chances in any of those times. Right. You got Nikola Vucevic, his prime pretty much wasted. He's in Chicago now. He might waste more of his prime there unless they make some moves. Yeah. They're, I, I almost can't describe the place. I think I might have said it, Limbo. Mm-hmm. It looks like they're, it seems like they're stuck in purgatory. Yep. Still looking for a new coach. A bunch of young pieces that kind of don't fit together, but could mm-hmm. maybe. You drafted Mo Bamba two years ago, and you've barely played him or done anything with him mm-hmm. when he's healthy. Jonathan Isaac's had injury problems. Injuries, he was promising. Yeah, they ended up getting Wendell Carter, off who, the who played his butt off once he got to Orlando last year. Yeah, drafted Cole Anthony, who's your guard of the future. Markel Fultz before he got hurt. That really just sunk all the like the promise of the season because Markel was playing really well, and they kind of got a little bit of a steal in R.J. Hampton off yeah. the Aaron Gordon trade, which R.J. Hampton now could get minutes, and he played good for the Magic. Um, yeah. As a guy coming off the bench, maybe as a six man, he could be really effective for them. But yeah, so who does the uh, Bleacher Report have them taking? The five, the fifth out of the five guys, Jonathan Kuminga. Okay. And this is a dude that I almost liked more than Jalen Green in the G League season because this is a term. Every, there's NBA comps for every prospect coming in every year now, but mm-hmm. Kawhi-type talent is a thing that's coming out now. For Pat Williams, last year coming out of Florida State, that's the type of comp he got. Right, High-level defense, 6'8", 220-something, and a lot of potential on offense. Chicago Bulls took a risk on him, took him fourth. Mm-hmm. He showed signs during the season, but he still has a lot to work on. 
Jonathan Kuminga to me is a more talented version of Pat Williams. He's just as big, like a uh, inch taller, maybe he's like six nine, almost two thirty. But he's even more athletic. He's even more fluid on offense, still raw. But he showed things in the G League games where he didn't play around when he got the ball. He would get the ball on the mid post area, face up, maybe pump fake, spin move, layup, mm-hmm. jab step, mid range jumper. He hit a few threes. He would. He knows how to use his strength already at his young age. He would bully somebody backing up and then get an easy layup or go to the free throw line. Like he got, he must have gotten really good coaching because most players his age they like to play around and just shoot threes, try to have crazy handles. He, it looked like he spent some time going to the Kawhi school mm-hmm. of simple moves, pump fakes, jab steps, little spin moves, little crossovers, nothing too crazy, just effective moves that'll get you where you need to go. Yeah. And if he keeps working on that, he could be special. If he could, if he could get better in those areas, but who knows? Some dudes don't. Right. Kawhi's guys like Kawhi Leonard are rare, mm-hmm. but these guys with these similar builds keep getting these comps. Yeah, Kaminga has so, that upside. It wouldn't be a bad pick because Orlando is in that area where they just have a bunch of young dudes that they're trying to mold and figure out. Yeah. So I would take Kaminga if I was them. And Orlando's going to get another pick at eight as yeah. well. So, But then I think you have to figure out what you're going to do with Jonathan Isaac soon because I'm pretty sure his rookie contract is about to be up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you got Jonathan Isaac. What are you going to do with Mo Bamba? And you got guys coming off of injuries. They got a lot of stuff to figure out. Right. So throwing in another piece that they have to mold is a negative and a positive at the same time. Right. Because it's just going along with, with what they've been doing for the past eight, nine years. Yep. How how will it be any different? That's the question. Mm-hmm. You draft this kid, you bring him in. What position are you going to put him in to get better? Because they haven't done that done it with Mo Bamba, right? And they did it with Cole Anthony last year, mm-hmm. and all the other guys they've traded for and signed. So they they just got to prove it. Honestly, with Orlando, it's a we just got to wait and see. Right. Yeah. Um. Okay. Since we're running out of time. Let's just stick with those. Let's just finish with those. Um, those top five. We'll do more draft talk next week. Yeah, we can pick it up next week. Um, because those are kind of those top five guys that we were talking about. Um, I wanted to get in quickly to the NIL stuff. Uh, name, image, and likeness for college athletics. Um, it's finally here. Yeah. So players are going to be able to be paid, whether they get sponsorships. Or sponsorships, starting their own companies. There, there have been a few guys in college football that have already started their own stuff. Yep. Dylan Gabriel from UCF started his own. I think it was a clothing company. Mm-hmm. He had a bunch of pictures with his initials DG all over like shirts and like hoodies and stuff. The Eric King and Mackenzie Milton quarterbacks in Miami and Florida state. They've partnered on some things. Yep. Um, I forgot which quarterback it was. They got a sponsorship with Canes, mm-hmm. the, the Southern yeah. uh, food or DF. Yeah restaurant so a lot of guys are already jumping on things and the big thing that came out yesterday even is that uh the university of miami decided that they uh took up like a sponsorship with all of their football team so there is a deal i guess in place where their entire football team will be given a contract for twenty thousand dollars for their season, which is crazy. See, the, I don't think that's terrible when it comes to college athletes. Mm-hmm. There are people acting like just because you're taking the, just because you're giving them these opportunities, they're professionals now. That's not, they're not being played. I mean, they're not being paid to play football, basketball, whatever they're playing. Right. If you're good enough, yeah, you'll get some opportunities. Mm-hmm. And certain teams like Miami, if they're smart enough to get opportunities for their whole team, that's going to happen. Right. But that's not going to be every school, mm-hmm. and it's not going to be every athlete. Exactly. There are athletes, the 12th man on the basketball team probably isn't going to get a big sponsorship. Yeah. But if the team like wins their conference and they get like a local car dealership commercial or something, right. cool. This is These are things that are okay for college athletes. And yeah. I don't – yeah, the the older brains that think, like I said, they're going to be professionals now, I just, I just don't understand how they think that way when, yeah. when you really think about it. Right. Because, yeah, sponsorships, starting their own thing, $20,000, 
it's it's decent for college athletes. To me, it's almost like an allowance to me. Yeah. Which I thought was a solid idea, just giving guys allowances and giving them a little bit of extra money than the normal college person gets. Yeah. When you're making billions off of these guys, they deserve a little bit. Yeah. I think the only crazy thing is like, so you're telling me that $20,000 is going to go to the starting quarterback. $20,000 is also going to go to the third string quarterback. If the team now it, most yeah. likely that first string quarterback is also going to have other sponsorship. Yeah, the, the things. quarterback for Miami, he's he's also he has his, like his right. hand in other things. So I figure that that's fine. But I'm just throwing it out there, and it starts to throw into things about like, okay, well, I'm just going to go to Miami so I can play football and have twenty thousand dollars, and that's going to help their recruiting and stuff too potentially. Um, so I get where there's some like thin line gray area type things that could happen, but at least now it's more legal, you know, whereas before it was like all under the table and stuff like that. So, I mean, I'm all for, you know, players being able to be able to get money for, you know, just making a business commercials and stuff. And that gives them experience though, too, that like you probably otherwise wouldn't get. Like, they can start making business decisions while they're playing football. So. And that's also a good and a bad because I think in this first year, this is pretty much like an experiment in this first it, year. Yeah, obviously. exactly. There are going to be guys that make great decisions and are set up, set themselves up for the next 10, 20 years. Mm-hmm. And there are going to be guys that just jump into something because money is there. Exactly. Seeing the ratio of guys that do it right and do, guys that do it wrong, that's going to be really interesting to see after this first year and the next few years because there, there are going to be some lessons taught. After these first few years, because everybody isn't going to be making great decisions. Right. Some guys are going to get little con- little sponsorships or contracts, and they're going to blow it. Mm-hmm. And then they might not make it to the NFL, and then they're going to be mad. And it's, I like that it's all on them now. Right. That's what I like. Mm-hmm. I, I don't like when you take the choice away from them, but you make billions off of them, but you also say, oh, you get an education. That's fine enough. Right. As That's not enough. Mm-hmm. You can't make everything off of them and just say education. Right. Give them a choice. Yeah. Now they have the choice. If they mess it up, it is what it is. Mm-hmm. But at least they have it. And it also helps the little guy too, where like if if you are that third string quarterback and you're probably not ever gonna make like the NFL, maybe you'll play some like CFL type stuff or something like that. But it allows you to make like a brand of yourself and like be able to market yourself. Like if you have a really cool social media following, all of a sudden that you bid like, hey, I'm the third string quarterback for Michigan. I don't play, but here I am. Exactly. There, like, there are second and third string guys that have more personality. Exactly. Than first, than like most of their first stringers do. Mm-hmm. And imagine if, like Pat McAfee, right. if NIL was out when he was playing, mm-hmm. the punter of West Virginia that nobody really knew at the time, but people would have known Pat McAfee. Yeah. Because he would have been all over commercials and sponsorships and stuff, yeah. just being a fool. Or like I think about the guys that you you see on a lot of the basketball teams. At the end of the bench that are doing all the, yeah. the celebrations and stuff, those guys, maybe they can get a little something. Um, but yeah, it's cool that they finally, you know, they finally proved it. There's gonna be some bumps in the road, definitely, but it's a good start. And, you know, now we're getting an NCAA football game. I was just about to say video this, game. <laughs> the selfish part of me that I, I'm not even like ashamed to admit how selfish I am, that I I'm just happy these games are back. I'm pretty sure EA Sports just announced, like, they put up a picture of, like, a few, like, classic sports games. And I, actually, they didn't put it up. Somebody on Twitter put it up. But EA, EA Sports announced that they're bringing back a, a classic sports game. Yeah. And a lot of people think it might be March Madness. Mm. Which, hey, just just bring them back, man. Yeah. This is, you got to do them right, though. Yeah. This is, video games are in a really weird time right now. They, they got to figure out a way to do them right if yeah. they're bringing them back. Yep, I agree. Well, this has been Views from the Sideline. It's been a busy couple weeks, and, you know, sports are sort of dying out right now, but they're kind of getting going. Like I said, we'll talk more NBA draft. We'll get into the Olympics. Maybe we'll discuss if Reggie Bush should get his Heisman back. We'll see you guys next time. Can you imagine how much money Johnny Manziel would have made? They would have had to bring the rule back because he would have been scamming people out of stuff. It would have been a mistake.